Losers today. Winners and losers. We jokingly call some of our friends real losers, <laughs> but we shouldn't. <laughs> and <clears throat> but I'll tell you, in our culture, there are a lot of losers. And we want to make sure that we are not losers. And it seems like the way things are going in our culture, that it's very easy to go backwards, to get into debt, to uh, get behind in things, let things go downhill, and it seems like each day it gets worse rather than better. But today I want to share with you some stories and some parts of Scripture to change that trend. If you feel that you are going backwards and backwards and backwards and getting deeper and deeper into problems, I want to show you what the Word of God says about being a winner, about gaining and not losing. Now, last Sunday, I mentioned with to you, <clears throat> I'm going to get something for my throat here. So, sorry about that, but it just seems like this season, it's very easy to get stuffy, right? So I, I apologize, <clears throat> but it happened. Last week, I saw, gave you a little illustration to help you understand what the message is going to be today. Does anybody remember what the passage of Scripture was that I asked you to think about? Anybody remember? <laughs> Vasily! Vasily's on the ball. <laughs> Boy, are you, you people have great memories, I'll tell you. <laughs> You're really good. <laughs> okay, just, just, just to rehearse. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Can we read that together? One, two, three. But godliness with contentment is great gain. That, that is the, the sixth, the first Timothy 6.6. 6. Okay? Now, last week I told you a story, a true story, of some gangs in Chicago. Remember? And this church youth group went to visit, went around the corner to find the gangs. And they shared their testimonies. And the gang leader, at the end, lined them up and said, I want to talk to you. And he lined them up and he said, you, you don't have peace. And you over here, you have peace. You have peace. You have peace. You don't. You don't have peace. And just by looking at them and listening to what they had to say, he could perceive that. You know, what was so accurate about that was that those who did not have peace that year when they went off to school and came back at the, at the beginning of summer, the ones who did not have peace were no longer walking with the Lord. They, were, they walked away. They were backsliding. They turned away. Whatever happened. Now, the question is, how could this gangster, so to speak, have that insight into ones that have peace and ones that don't have peace. But my, my, uh, my conclusion, though, is this, that we should strive to be at peace with the God, with our Lord Jesus, that we should have peace in our life. Now, as you know, I'm quite a fan of Jonathan Edwards who preached up here in Enfield 200 years ago or more. Just the great, greatest awakening that this nation ever had. They call it the first awakening. But also, to me, the spiritual truths that were brought forth to the people were the basis of our Constitution. And the people were saying, wow, I enjoy this freedom I have in God. My sins are forgiven. No more guilt. No more shame. I enjoy all of this that I have. And it's so good to be free. And they said, let's start a nation built on that freedom. And that's what it was. But he has some profound thoughts. He was one of the best thinkers I know of that this country ever had. 
And here's one of the thoughts that I want to just roll around with you today. And I ask you this. Are you satisfied with all that God is for you in Jesus? That was a direct quote from Jonathan Edwards. Now think that through. Are you satisfied with all that God is for you in Jesus? Are you satisfied? And he goes on to explain. He says, God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. God is most glorified. And I believe that's our, our desire in our life, to glorify God. Is that not right? We want to glorify him. And the best way to glorify him is to be most satisfied in him. And so that, that, that gives me a challenge to think about all that Jesus is to me. All that Jesus is to you. Can you begin to think and make a list of all that Jesus Christ is for you? Just think of all that. Now, when you can think that through and when you can apply it to your life, that scripture again becomes true. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, what I'd like to do is look up, whenever I put a message together, I think of the positive things that I want to say. And then I say, is there anything in the opposite side of that, the negative side of that? So what I want to, first of all, just explore the term godliness. What does godliness mean? What's it mean to you? Now, I want to look at that. But the first thing, and, 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 and in Timothy, 1 Timothy, there's a description of it. But I want to look at 2 Timothy, chapter 3, where it talks about what is ungodly and see how many of these things find their way into your lives. And this is now the reference of 2 Timothy chapter 3, the first five verses. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abrasive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. Wow, that's almost like reading a newspaper. It's almost like reading our newspaper on how people treat each other. It is tragic. It is sad. Having the form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Now, the form of godliness. Now, sometimes we as Christians, even Christians can have what I call Christianese, that there's certain language that we learn and we take things lightly, like Many people can say, well, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. They're, they're going around praising the Lord for everything. And, and when you talk to them, you seem like they have no needs. It's amazing that they just got everything all together. And to me, that is, if that I don't believe is true. I think that they are hiding behind what I call a religious spirit. They know the things to say, but they are restless. They have that religious spirit. They have no peace. They have no contentment. They're just chung, chung, chung. And they don't know really what godliness is. Now, let, look, let's look at godliness. And that is in 1 Timothy chapter 6, which starts with the verses that we had here. And I'll read that, 1 Timothy 6, 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap that in, and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. 
So here's, this is helping us to understand what contentment is and what godliness is. And it says here that if you have food and clothing and implied shelter, that you can be content with as far as the world brings to us. But now we want to talk about contentment from God's point of view. What does it mean to be content in God? And this, pa- this passage goes on to explain that, starting at verse 11 now in chapter 6. But you, O man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness, fight the good fight of faith, take hold of eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. I charge you to keep this commandment without spot or blame until the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed only ruler, King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal, who lives in unapproachable light, whom has seen or can see, to give honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. What a description of how a Christian should live our life. And that to me is godliness. Now, I think it's so important to learn what godliness is rather than just flip terms but real a matter of our searching of our heart in uh, Luke chapter 9 verse 25 it says what is a profit a man if he gain the whole world and loses his own soul what's a profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul and forfeits his whole life and in Matthew 5 6 it says Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be satisfied. But if we're not seeking God in the right way, in a humble way, in a faithful way, the Spirit, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, and we're not satisfied, we'll be restless, discontent, no peace. What is godliness then if you don't have peace in your life? In Titus chapter 3, there's a, neat little description of what is good. <clears throat> and I think, let's just listen to this in, in Titus chapter 3, verse 8. For it is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. One of the paradoxes of our culture today, I think, is this. That we can't, that our culture will not let us describe and qualify and quantify what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong. You talk to some people, say, maybe that's wrong for you, but not me. And he said, what is, what is the standard for what is right and wrong? And they said, whatever you think. And those of us who are Christians know that this is the standard right here. And it's very, very explicit and clear to do good as defined by God, to do right as defined by God. And you know, it's a comfortable place. It's not a law of bondage. It's like, well... I'm, the Holy Spirit's working in me and I know I shouldn't do that and I won't do it. Or the Holy Spirit's working in me and prompting me, yes, you ought to go visit that person. You ought to see that person. You need to pray for that person. That person might need something. You need to give to that person. That's good. And God wants us to do that. And that is godly when we can do good. Now, that's the first term, godliness. Now, what is contentment? And man, this is an interesting passage in, in Isaiah. 
that I have found, Isaiah chapter 55, about what is contentment. And it's interesting in our culture too. So Isaiah 55, starting at verse 1. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the water. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread? And your labor on what does not satisfy. Listen, listen to me. Eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the riches of, of fare. Give ear to come to me. Hear me, that you may that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David, King David. Amazing, some of these things. What is contentment? Have you ever have days when you struggle? When someone says, someone says how you doing? You say, oh man, I'm struggling. I'm struggling. I'm having a difficult time. That's when we have to understand what godliness and contentment is. I know sometimes I, I think of our pets when I think of contentment. Now, we happen to have a lot of experience with cats, but many of you might have experience with dogs, too. But they, they, somehow those animals have the ability to be content. I don't know what percentage of the life of a cat spends sleeping. <laughs> you know, a huge percent. I watched the statistics somewhere. And that, to me, is the ultimate test of whether you're content. I mean, if you're really content, that cat will get a, you know, feed the cat, It'll snuggle up by the fireplace, rest of the day, happy and content. And that's what, that's a good illustration to us. God will take care of us. God said, I'll supply the food, I'll supply the clothing. You can be content in the things of this life. Now, what happens, well, we got, of course, we need to, one of the major things for contentment is in Hebrews chapter 13, 5, which you quoted today, I will never leave you nor forsake you, Jesus said. I'll always be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I, there's, there's some, it it's also talks about the fact that you don't need to have love. You don't need to have the love of money. You need to be free from the love of money. You need love, but not the love of money. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God, it says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So they say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Okay. One of the things that we need to, for contentment is to learn the difference between the voice of the devil and the voice of God. We need to have a, gain that. And I found that in one of, one of the greatest sins that I have in my life, or the greatest sins that we can have in our life, is, is unbelief. That we don't believe God. We just don't believe. We think this circumstance is way too big, way out of his control. So we don't believe. We just not trust. And that unbelief is the root of what is based of the basis of malcontent, not content, just not, just not resting in God. So we need to have that deep faith. And I'm not talking about hyper faith where if you just give enough here, you'll get this, where we sometimes have God as like a vending machine. If we deal over this over here, we'll make a deal with him and he'll make a deal with us. Not that at all. I'm talking about... You can take that deep trust. I trust God. I trust Him. I trust Him for the future. And, and I trust Him. And many times God will give us a promise when some things are difficult. We think of our children. We think of our government. We think of our nation. We think of what is the future. What is the future? Will the grace of God be there? Will there there be future grace? Can we absolutely say 
God, I believe your promise. You said you'd turn it around. You said there would be revival. You said my son, my daughter, my children, my grandchildren. You said that they would not stray, that they would never leave you nor forsake you, that they would be with you, that they'd be walking with you. God, I have those promises. And God, guess what? I believe. I believe in the nature of Jesus Christ. And I'm satisfied, God. I have contentment, God, in all that you mean to me through Jesus Christ. And I think it sometimes remind me of that old song, Count Your Blessings, Name Them One by One. When you think of things are going tough, when it just doesn't seem like a breakthrough, like, wow, God, we need, we need your wisdom, we need your direction, please, please, God. And you take that and you promise to God, I remember you promised me this. You promised, and your promises are yea and amen, and they don't change. And God, I have peace. I am satisfied that I can put my faith in those promises. I am satisfied in you, God. I'm not looking for another God. I'm not looking for another whim. I'm not looking for another thrill. I'm content in you. I trust you. I trust you, I trust you, I trust you. Okay, now, the last point, first of all, just to review for your thinking. Godliness, talked about it. Contentment, just finished talking about it. Now, great gain. What does that mean, great gain? Gain in godliness. Gain in the spirit world. You know, I've, I've convinced that when we get our lives right in the spirit world, when we are right with him and we're comfortable with him, these other material things, the food, the clothing, those things that we're sort of longing for, they fall right in place. They're not, our, they're not the soul of our passion. They're not the, they're not the, the, our burning passion is to hunger and thirst after God. God, I want more of you. I, that's my passion. That's my goal. I want that God. I want you. I want you more than a new car. I want you more than to being out of debt even. I want you more than to, 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 to than have a great name. I want you more than anything. God, I hunger and thirst after you. And your promise was that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. You will be content. And one, I guess one of the greatest, greatest definitions of great gain in this world and in our life is peace. What I would say is peace. Just think of all that people try to do to gain peace, to gain satisfaction, to gain completion. Just think of all the things that try, people try to do. And of course, we've got all kinds of medicines and, every, and pills and stuff to try and help us in that area too. I'm not talking about necessarily world peace, which would be a great thing, but I'm talking about that inner peace, that inside you where you have peace. We know, as Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. We know that. Do you believe that? Does that give you peace? Do you trust in his word? Do you trust in that? Is that the word of God? Is that a rhema live word for you? Do you believe that? All things work together for good to them who love God and call according to his purpose. And then, of course, we have Romans 8, 1 and 2, which is, the trans I'm not sure it'll be this translation, but uh, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, to those who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Wonderful, wonderful promises. Wonderful promises. See, we need to think through some of the things in our life before that comes upon us. My wife always kids me. She, you know, you can't think on your feet, so think it through before. Get, think, think it through ahead of time. So I said, okay, so I shall work on that because I'm a slow thinker. Okay, I get meticulous in my thinking, but slow. 
okay? And it seems like it's getting slower, but, the, <laughs> but I'm, come, I'm still at it. I'm still at it, okay? <laughs> Keep it up. Okay. <laughs> here's, what I'm, here's what I'm thinking, is that just think of the consequences of following the lies of the devil rather than the truth of Jesus Christ. Think of the lies, his lies. And it's, it's, he lies to us all the time. He said, now, you can do that because everybody else does it. And the, you say, but my conscience says no. The word of God says, no, I can't do that. I, because the result will not be peace. The result will be turmoil, broken relationships, fearful things happening, bad things happening. So I'm not going to do that. Even though everybody's doing it, or another lie that a Satan always says is just a little bit. Just a little bit. You know, you just think you're much better than all those other people down your block. But just a little bit. And but the consequences of just a little bit is a lot. Is a lot. And so we need to think through the lies that the devil gives us. And don't follow them. And I think it was Jim Elliot who says, <clears throat> he is no fool who loses what he cannot gain to gain what he cannot lose. And there's a man who went down to Africa, down to, uh, to Ecuador. Okay, thank you. Ecuador and gave his life, was really slaughtered uh, by the na natives there. And what is an amazing thing he, he said this, you know, he gave up his life to gain eternal life and, and, and suffer no loss, so to speak. He lost his life here, but he gained what he could not lose. That was eternal life in the kingdom of God. And what was amazing to me is his wife went back to that very tribe and led those people to the Lord. It's amazing. I mean, can you talk, can you tell me of any greater gain from God's point of view that the kingdom of God was introduced to these native people for thousands of years who were, had no idea that there was a Savior and that there's a Jesus and that there's a the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? What a, what a gain. What a tremendous gain. I guess I'd ask you in conclusion, are you satisfied with all that God is to you in Jesus, in that fellowship? He's our healer. He's our savior. He's our deliverer. He's our, the power in our life. It's, we might have the form of godliness denying the power thereof, but no longer. We uh, believe in the power of. Many times, many Christians will say, well, you, you guys emphasize the Holy Spirit too much or the charismatic movement and all that. And that was fine for the beginning of the church when that was just the prime started, to get it jump started, but not for today. No, I don't see any place in Scripture where it says it's not for today. I said it's for us. We want that power. We want that life. Our faith is alive. It's not just a list of do's and don'ts. It's not just a list of I believe this, I believe that, I don't believe this. It's right here. It's power. It's life. It's great gain. There's no other challenge. There's no other answer to life than what God has for us in his word. Are you content and satisfied with all that God is for you in Jesus? That was the question that Jonathan Edwards asked hundreds of years ago. And I think it's a very penetrating question, a very deep one, because, because it has us think, what does Jesus mean to me? What does he mean to me as the Son of God? Godliness with contentment is great gain. Amen. Okay. Hope you remember that.